Today we're going to learn uh, Sukkah Daf Lamed Zion. Today's Daf is sponsored by Tali Brown Kaslowski in honor of the first year at site of my grandfather, Harvey Brown, Chaim Eli Ben Yehuda Noach, who was an avid learner, always found with a safer in hand, even on the beach. And also in honor of the first year at site of Rabbi David Moss, father of Talia Moss, and former executive director of Orto or Stone, may their Nishamot have an Aliyah. Okay, we're going to start from the bottom of Lamed Vav Amud Bet. We were learning about the the types of things that you can use for an egged for a binding a lulav, and we saw that um, Rava said, if you remember, Rabbi Yehuda said you can only use its type. The rabbi Rabbi Meir uh, Rabbi Meir said you could use anything you want. So Rava said, according to Rabbi Yehuda, afilu b'siv afilu b'ikara didikli, you can even use the fibers of the palm tree or even the trunk. And then he wanted to prove, how do I know this? So we brought a bright that talked about that you can use, according to Rabbi Meir, a sukkah can be made of anything, meaning the schach of the sukkah can be made of anything. According to Rabbi Yehuda, it has to be made from one of the four species. Okay, you have to use that. And then the rabbi said to him, what are you talking about? That's a chumrah. You're using a kava chumrah argument, if you remember, he used this argument, because lulav is only during the day, and yet it's limited to the four and yet sukkah is day and night you're obligated, so it's more stringent or more strict. Therefore, you also, you must, it must be that the stringencies of lulav apply also to there. They has to be limited to the four. To which the rabbi said, then you're basically going to be machmir here, and then that's going to cause people to be lenient. And that's not something that we want to encourage, right? Because then in the end, people aren't going to fulfill the mitzvah, right? Sometimes if you go too strict, you're going to end up with backlash, right? We know this with all sorts of things, including, let's say, I'll give an example, a, a more controversial example, but Hilchot Sniut, right? If you go too far, because I, I can't dress that, that Sanua, right? It's, it's too hot out, right? You make it so, so overwhelming to people, they're going to end up just rejecting it entirely, right? It's also always difficult when they don't know, is this a stringency or is this halacha? And, right, it just becomes very overbearing. So you have to be careful so that, and this is like in religion in general, the more strict you make it, you might end up losing people who say, this is way too much for me, I can't handle it. So this is a little bit different, but it's the similar concept. So now they say, um, so we're in the middle of this bright to trying to prove, we haven't yet gotten to his proof how we know it can be done with the, the fibers or the, the branch or the, um, or the trunk. So then we said, be'ezra. So now the rabbis are trying to prove. We have to sit in a sukkah, it could be made of anything. And how do we know? Well, there's a verse in Ezra where he told the people, Tzu ha'hal, go out to the mountains, v'aviu ale zayit, v'aleit shemen, bring leaves from the olive tree and from the oil tree, which not exactly sure what the oil tree might be, but some other kind of tree, clearly not one of the, the four. V'ale hadas, v'aleit marim, v'aleit savot. And leaves from hadas, leaves from palm trees, and leaves from it's a vote, right? Interesting. Ale it's a vote is what we said is also hadas. It's interesting. Lasot um, sukot. It should be lasot, not vasu. Lasot sukot kakatuf. To do the sukot as it says. So now here, what do you see? You see that they used other things that were not part of the four species. So from here you see, it seems like you could build a sukkah from anything. Such the rabbis prove. For Rabbi Yehuda, what's he going to say? Rabbi Yehuda, saval, hanei litfanot. Ale hadas, vale itmalim, vale itzavot, laschach. Right. Those are used for the walls. The other ones are used for the schach. And then you have an easy distinction. You say, oh, walls, you can use anything. But Rabbi Yehuda was talking about the schach. That's what we said before. He says, you have to use one of the four species. That's for the real mitzvah. Remember, the walls are just, has to have walls. But it's not important what they're made of. It's the schach that's important. That you have to use. So when he told them, gather all these leaves, some of the leaves were for the walls, the ones from the from the hadas and and the palm tree were for the schach. Okay, we still don't have our proof yet. Now here comes our proof. Utnan. The Mishnah says, if you remember, we learned this on Daf Yudalid, Misachachim benisarim divrei Rabbi Yehuda. You can use wooden boards. Remember there was this whole machloket. Don't wooden boards look like your house? And there was a machloket, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda. There was a whole debate about their machloket, exactly in which case, what size, what width of boards we're talking about. We'll get back to that in a minute. But it says you can use boards of wood. So now where does wood come from? Trees. So Alma, what do you see from here? Right? None of the four species themselves. The lulav itself is not the tree. You would be using a, a board can't be made of a lulav. 
And it certainly can't be made of a hadas or an arava or an etro. So what could a boar be made of? Obviously, it must be, right? Rabbi Yehuda says you can use wooden boards. So what do you see? Alma, for sure then, therefore, siv ikara de dikla, mina de lulvahi. These are clearly types of lulavim because otherwise it wouldn't be one of the four species, right? You wouldn't be able to use wooden boards if not from one of the four species. So therefore, shmami. Now, that's Rava's proof. Now the Gemara says, wait a minute. We have a problem on Rabbi Yehuda's approach in general. But we have sources that seem to indicate that Rabbi Yehuda doesn't need only the Arba Aminim. How do we know this? Because it says, Vahatanya says in a Braita, Sichicha benisarim shal eres, she yesh bayam arbaat vachim divreya kol psula. He said, if you use wooden boards of eres, eres is a cedar tree. Now, last I checked, it was not part of the four species. So, if you use boards of a cedar tree, she yesh bayam arbaat vachim, that have four tvachim, that are, now we get into the widths. If it's four tvachim wide, divreya kol psula. Everyone will agree that it's disqualified, even Rabbi Yehuda. But but if there are boards of cedar that are less than four tfachim wide, that's when we have a machlok at Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Meir posel for Rabbi Yehuda machshir. This is Shmuel's interpretation of their machlok at. Rabbi Meir agrees though that if each of the the empty spaces, if you have wooden boards with empty spaces in between, you have wooden, empty, wooden, empty, wooden, empty, then you fill the empty spaces with kosher schach, then it's okay, because then it doesn't really have an appearance of a house, and we're not worried that, oh, you might think your house could be used as a sukkah. So now, what's the main problem, though? It said, Ere is cedar, and that's not one of the four species, and then Rabbi Yehuda said, this is okay, as long as they are not four tvachim wide. So what are the answer? My Erez, what is Erez referred to here? Hadas, it actually is referring to the myrtle branches. How do, no, you can't just stam say this, you have to prove it. Kedir Rava Barav Huna, as Rava Barav Huna says, Amar Rava Barav Huna, Amar Rebbe Rav, he says, they say in the house of Rav, Asaramine Arazim Heim, there's 10 types of cedars. Cedar is a much broader, it's not the way we think of just a cedar tree, but the word Erez, I wouldn't even say cedars, I would say the word Erez refers to 10 different types, and one of those types is Hadas. Okay, and we're going to see this now. Shenemar etem b'midbar eres shitav hadas. There it lists seven, and there it's not so clear from the verse that eres means those, but they list eres along with others. And Rabbi Baruch Huna says those are all, including another few, are all types of things that could be called eres. So therefore, we assume when he says sechachab nesarim shal eres, he meant ones that were hadas. Okay, you could explain it that way, right? It's not necessarily the simple reading, but since you could, therefore, we don't knock out Rabbi Huda's approach. And we can be left with that Rabbi Huda really requires that your sukkah be made from one of the four species, which is just interesting in the sense of he's attempting, and we'll talk about this also later today, this idea of combining the four species and sukkah and somehow merging them together, that there's some connection between them. Interestingly, we don't hold that way, but he does seem to connect these two as if there's a significance and there's an overlap of them. Um, it's not two different mitzvot that happen to be both on the holiday of Sukkot, but there's an, over, there's an overlap of those two. Rabbi Meir Romer, afilu b'mishicha. Now, this is a quote from the Mishnah, although if you notice, it's not exactly a quote from the Mishnah, because our Mishnah said, afilu b'chut b'mishicha, and this gets rid of the word chut and says, afilu b'mishicha. When we read the Mishnah, there was a bit of, we talked about a difference of opinion. Is it even with a string and with a cord, or is it, Afilu bechut b'mishicha. You can even do it with a string, and mishicha is describing how you do it with a string, which is unclear exactly what that means. But here you see that afilu b'mishicha, even with a cord, it clearly this version of the text that the Gemara had in front of it, which was different from our Mishnah, clearly supports the reading that there's even bechut and even b'mishicha, right? That it's both. Um, even though it doesn't list chut, obviously, if, if with a cord, then obviously with a string, because again, a cord is much more noticeable. It's thicker. It's more noticeably different, which you would think would be a problem, but it's not, according to Rabbi Meir. And then they quote here a Brighton, which is very, very, very similar to the Mishnah. To wonder what's the difference and why do they quote it? So, Amar Rabbi Meir, Maasev Yikirei Yerushalayim, the wealthy of Jerusalem, or the special people of Jerusalem, not exactly clear what Yakire, right? The, the Yakar is expensive. It's also something that's valued. Right? The more valued people of Jerusalem, which doesn't necessarily mean the wealthy, although here it does seem like it connects with wealthy because they're going to use gold. 
They would use these either rings or strings of gold. And then they said to him, that's not a proof. You want a proof from there that you can use anything? It doesn't have to be the same type. They would have the real egg that was underneath and the gold was above. Again, we said either above in height or above meaning around it. So this is exactly what it said in the Mishnah. What are the differences? There's two differences. One is Yikire Yerushalayim. Instead of Anshe Yerushalayim, Anshe Yerushalayim sounds like all the people of Jerusalem. And this sounds like a small, unique group. Okay? Um, some people even have a version that says Yihire, those arrogant ones, the ones we always talk about, Yehorah, if you do something special for a mitzvah, is it looked at as Yehorah? To look like you're bragging. Maybe it's a bad thing. Almost you can even think with that version, maybe they didn't like the people were doing this because it showed we're better than other people and that's not so nice, right? We can do the mitzvah nicer than you. So there's a debate about how exactly to read this. Or maybe they say, no, no, this was some unique way that people celebrate the mitzvah in a unique way, right? Some special people had a whole different way of doing this mitzvah. Not a whole different way. They just did it fancier than others, right? Like anything. We know there's people who have, you know, a very simple challah board. They use even like a, a wooden slab. And some people have a fancy one, right? It's, it's like hidor mitzvah. So the people, there were certain people who were able to do it nicer than others, and they did, right? Could be looked at as bad. Could be looked at as not bad. It depends. Depends your perspective. It depends on all sorts of things. Whereas the Mishnah made it sound like it was everybody was doing this, which is hard to believe that everyone had gold around to be able to use to put around their lulas. Um, okay, so now that's um, and then the other minor difference is the words Misham Raya didn't appear in the Mishnah. In the Mishnah, they just said, "What do you mean, Bimino Dimoto? But here it says, "What you want to use that as your proof." there, I don't think there's really any difference in terms of meaning. It really means the same thing. It's just whether they said the words, what? You want to prove from there? But either way, they meant, do you want to prove from there? You can't really prove it from there. Amar lehu Rabbah. Now we're going to start a slew of statements that Rabbah is going to recommend to people all sorts of things because he's worried about a chatzitza. He doesn't want there to be any separation between the person and the mitzvah, and, and, the, and the lulav, and the etrog, and all those things themselves, there would be no barrier, something, separation. Usually we know chatzitza from laws of mikvah. You can't go in the mikvah with anything else on your body. So likewise here, you don't want to have anything separating between you and the lulav, or between parts of the lulav in itself, and we'll see. And he lists a whole bunch of things, and each time Rava, who's a generation below him, but living at the same time, Rava comments, this is not a chatzitza, this is not a problem. So let's go through his list. Amalahu Rabba Lahanu Megadle Hoshana. Megadle doesn't mean they're growing, which usually Megadle means. Here Megadle means the Ogdim, the people who bound the Hoshanas, meaning the Lulav to the, the other two species. Debe Resh Galuta in the house of the Exilarch. Ki Gadlitu Hoshana Debe Resh Galuta. When you bind the Hoshanas in the house of Resh Galuta, Shaire Be Beit Yad. Leave some part out of it, meaning make sure there's a place to hold the Lulav that's not where they're bound. Why? We don't want, we want your hand to directly hold the lulav and not to hold the egged. If you use the egged as a, a barrier, a separation between you and the mitzvah. He wants you to hold the mitzvah. Where do we see this? We see this in the temple with the Kohanim. They had to have no separation between them and what they were doing. Again, we see this correlation between work in the temple and holding the lulav. The lulav is a type of worship. And they wanted to compare it to worship in the temple. And therefore, he said, you can't have any barrier between you and the object. To which Rava says, what are you talking about? Rava Amar, kol in The egg comes to beautify it. Anything that beautifies the mitzvah is part of the mitzvah. It's not a problem. So now, three ways of the Rishonim of understanding this. One is to say, yeah, because it's part of ze'eli vanveyu. We want to make this more beautiful. Remember Lulav ain't sarich eged lahalacha, but the rabbi said it's nicer to do it that way. It looks nicer, right? It's more organized. So that's part of the mitzvah. So of course it doesn't it doesn't mean it's a separation, a barrier. Another possibility is to say it's actually nullified to the lulav. It has no significance. It has significance, but not compared to the lulav. It's just coming. It's a, an accessory. An accessory is kind of becomes part of the object because it's just an accessory, and therefore it's also not a separation. Third option is to say that it's actually considered part of the lulav itself. It's not like it's nullified. It's part of the lulav. And since it's the same type, we're going to see this, that Rava holds, min bimino eno chotzeitz. If you use something of the same type, that same type, even if it's a little bit different, it or it's not part of the mitzvah, it's this added thing, it's still of the same type can never become a separation. 
Okay, and we're going to get to that in a little while. So three ways of understanding why kol oto, anything that comes to beautify, eno chotzeitz. Ba'ama Rabba, another thing Rabba said, lo linku inish hoshana besudara, don't hold the lulav with a, she, with a, uh, a cloth or something. In other words, don't put your hand, let's say don't wear gloves when you're taking a lulav, okay? Don't have a cloth separating between you and the lulav. Why? Because de bi'ina l'kichatama, again, we have another use of this l'kichatama. We had l'kichatama to say each of the meaning has to be complete, not broken off. We saw it also in terms of you have to take, you have to have all four. You're missing one, you can't do the mitzvah because it's not complete. Here's a different complete. Complete, it has to be, you have to take a complete taking, which means you hold it yourself and not have something separating between you and the taking of it. The leka, and here you don't have that because you have something separating. Rabbi said, taking something with, you know, if you're wearing gloves or you have something, you're holding in between, that's still considered taking. That's not a problem. How do we know this? Well, he's going to try to prove it. Ditnan, as it says in the Mishnah, now we're moving into para aduma. We're going to have two different aspects. First, he's going to bring one. Then we're going to say you can't prove it. He's going to bring a different one. Ezov katsar. What you do with the para aduma, first you put the ashes into the water. We're going to get to that soon. After you have this mixture, they would put it in these tubes, these long tubes of reeds made out of reeds. They would put the water in there and then they would sep- they would give them out to different cities so the cities had the Paraduma waters with them. Now, it says, Rashi says this, Okay, they would bring it from city to city. I'm in the Rashi, Dibor Matril Ezov Katzal. Okay, with Shvoferet Shel Kanima Rukot, these long tubes of reeds. And then they would kind of hide them so that no one would get in contact with them so that they'd have them when they needed them. So now what's the problem? You're supposed to dip the Ezov, which is the hyssop branch, into these tubes. Dip it in, dip it in the water, pull it out, and right, it's the water mixed with ashes and spray it on someone. What if you have Ezov Katzal? You have one that's too short and it doesn't go all the way down. So how do you get it down, right? This is like a fishing rod almost. Misapko bechut ubekush. You add, right, you kind of add on to the hyssop branch a string or a kush, which is a spin, uh, a spinning implement. Okay, there's a nice picture in the Koran. It's like a very tall, thin thing. You add it. Vitovelu ma'ale. And you dip it and take it out. Very good. Ve'ochez be'ezovu mane. And then, mumazet. And then you hold this hyssop branch and you spray, right? You sprinkle on the person. Amai. But there it says in the Pasuk, you're supposed to take it. And you're supposed to dip it. So you need Lekichan. You're not actually holding the Hisap branch when you dip it. It says, take it and dip it. That sounds like you have to hold it with your hand. If you say Lekichan is with your hand and you can't do it with something else, this isn't. So this must prove that it's okay. So they say, no, 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 that doesn't work. Mimai. This isn't like the like the the cloth that we have in between us and the lulav, because this is attached to the hisap branch. So you're holding something that's attached to the hisap branch and dipping it in. That's really like holding it. But having some separation that's not attached to the lulav, and you're holding that that cloth that's separating between you and the lulav, that wouldn't be called lekicha. So he tries a different proof. Elamehacha. We can learn it from here. You have to pour the ashes into the water. Now, what if it just fell by itself without you intending? This goes back to our whole discussion of intention and how important intention plays a factor. Here, intention is a factor. So here, if it drops in by itself into the water, that's no good. But that seems to imply, if I dumped it though on purpose, seems to indicate what's missing just my intent, not my holding the ashes and putting the ashes physically by touching them into the into the shoka, which is the trough, right? The place where the water is. But it sounds like hai pilohu, if I dumped it in without touching the ashes, sounds like it would be kashel. Amai. Vilakhov and atan. It says you have to take it and you have to put it. I didn't put it because I, I was holding right the, the 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 tube that had the ashes in it. Amarachmanat. The Pasuk says, take, right, take it yourself and put it. Elalav shmamina. So from here you can infer lekichal yedei davar acher shma lekichal. That by taking something with something else, it's actually called taking it. Va'amar Rabba. Rabba says, lo ladutz inish lulava bahoshana, tedil manat chaytarfei vahavechatzitza. Another thing Rabba said, 
don't take, now we're assuming right now that rubber, the egg ed that we have on our lulav, which is very designed very well, that you could stick the lulav in without actually touching the hadassim in our avot. But they didn't have those fancy egg eds that we have nowadays. They just bound it. The, the three hadassim branches, the two arava branches, assuming that's how many you need based on our previous debate, and the lulav, and you want to basically, you bind them together and you want to stick the lulav in the middle. What's going to happen? You're going to knock off branches, right? That's don't stick the lulav into the hoshana. And don't bind first the hadassim and aravot and then stick the lulav inside. To dilma natre tarfe, maybe you'll knock off leaves. And then what's going to happen? We don't care if you knock off some leaves as long as they're not disqualified, but what's the problem? Have a These loose leaves are now going to be in between. Like you might have a hadas branch in between the lulav and arava or in between the lulav and hadas. And it's going to create a barrier in between the objects. So he says, that's a chatzitza. V'rav amal, min b'mino ino chatzitza. That's not a chatzitza, Rav says, because two things of the same type, meaning if you have had the same in between, the mitzvah, this is all part of the same mitzvah. It's all the same type. It's not going to create a barrier. V'amar Rabba. Furthermore, Rabba says, lo likuz inish lulava bahoshana, demishtai rehutza v'have chatzitza. Don't cut the lulav once it's already bound together. If you want to cut the bottom of the lulav, what will happen? We know that the lulav has a spine. And if you cut the bottom, what will happen? The outer leaves will basically be detached. If they're detached and yet they're bound together, once they're detached, they're not part of the mitzvah anymore because they're not part of the lulav. Again, they're going to create a separation. And obviously, you know what Rav is going to say. Rav says, Rav amar, mim bimino eno chotzeitz. It's not a problem. Okay, so there we finish the discussion between Rav and Rav about all sorts of potential problems that Rabbah sees with separation between you and the mitzvah, between the mitzvah, right, the different parts of the mitzvah and themselves. But each time Rabbah says, I don't view this as a problem. Amal Rabba. Now we have a different thing that Rabbah says, which is, Hadas shal mitzvah asur lahariach bo. You cannot smell a hadas that was designated for use for lulav and etro. This debate about at what point is designated. Remember we saw before, Hazmana ba'alma lo mitzvah, just saying, I want to use this for the mitzvah. So some people say it's only once you actually use it for the mitzvah. Then it's it's part of your lulav and etro. Then you can't use it. Maybe once you bound it. But a hadas of a mitzvah asur la riachbo. You can't smell it. But etro, shal mitzvah mutar la riachbo. But in etro, a mitzvah, you can smell. This, by the way, is like we saw about sukkah. Once it's designated for the mitzvah, you can't use the schach for anything else. So likewise here, but interestingly, the etrog you're allowed to smell. Why is that? My taima. Hadas de l'rei chakai, because the hadas is meant for smelling, ki aktie, when you designate it, me recha aktie. You designated it for the mitzvah. This comes from the word muktza, right? Aktie, muktza. Muktza is something that's set aside, right? either set aside for a particular use or set aside because nobody plans to use it, like rocks. We talked about that the other day. But ki aktie me recha aktie. When you designated it, you designated it for the smell. The purpose of the hadas is because of its beautiful smell. So therefore, it's for the mitzvah, for the purposes of smelling. But etrog de la achilakai, the etrog is really meant for eating. Now, it's true you don't really eat it for the mitzvah. But in etrog in general, what did you do? You said, I'm using this. I should say it differently. You're not, the hadas, you're not using for the purpose of smelling. But hadas is usually meant for smelling. And you're saying, I'm using this for the mitzvah. So you're saying, I'm not using it for smelling. Etrog is usually used for eating. Not that we all eat etrog game, but maybe they did then. People do use etrog for jam. So therefore, when you designate it for the mitzvah, you're saying it's not going to be used anymore for eating, but not that you can't smell it. So therefore, you're allowed to smell it. And therefore, um, okay, so that's this halacha. Now we get to another halacha. Amar Rabba, Rabba furthermore says, and this actually is going to talk about hadas and etrog, but having nothing to do with Sukkot, it's actually talking about on Shabbat. Hadas b'mechubar mutar laharichbo. When an hadas is attached to the ground, you can smell it. Etrog b'mechubar asur laharichbo. But in etrog, when it's attached to the tree, you can't smell it. Why is that? My taima. This is right. It's funny because it's the opposite. In this case, you can smell the hadas. You can't smell the etrog. But again, it has nothing to do with it. It's a totally different issue. Hadas de l'rechak de l'harichkai. But again, the purpose of hadas is to smell it. So isharit le lo ate l'migzei. Now we understand what the problem is. We're worried that you might cut it off on Shabbat, which you're not allowed to do. That's kotzer, right? Harvesting. So if we allow you to smell the hadas, once you smell it, you've done what you need with it. So you're not gonna, you're not gonna rip it off out of the ground. 
But etrog de la achila kai, since an etrog is meant for eating. Isharit le, if we allow you to smell it, you might say, oh, I want to eat this, and then atele migzie. It's likely you might pull it off the tree. Okay, what's interesting, there's a bunch of interesting things here, which is, number one, there's a whole debate about, are you allowed to touch it when you smell it? But can you touch it, or are we worried if you're touching it, then you actually might pull it off, and you only can just go near it and smell it, or some people say you actually can touch it. That's one. Rabbeinu Hanan actually has an opposite girsa here, which is interesting. He says, specifically, the hadas is more of a problem, and the etrog is less of a problem. And you can see, right, because when you go to smell it, you might, since it's meant for smell, you might actually pull it out of the ground. Whereas if you go to smell an etrog, you're just smelling something, but it's not really meant for smell, so therefore we're not really worried you're going to p- pluck it off the tree. So he has the opposite version of the Gemara. The Amarabba. Furthermore, Rabbi says, Lulav biyamin be'etrog b'smol. This we know. You hold the lulav in your right hand. You hold the etrog in your left hand. My time, or what's the reason? Hanei tlata mitzvot v'hai chada mitzvah. Ah. Why is the lulav go on the right? The, theoretically, right, always the more important one goes on the right. What do you think the etrog is the most beautiful one? That should go on the right. So they say no, because the lulav holds three mitzvot in one. So therefore, you should take that one in the right. Amalei Rabbi Yirmiyale Rabbi Zreka. Okay, by the way, there's another interesting thing here, which is, what if you did it wrong? Okay, there's a whole thing here. Um, Rabbeinu Hanana says that if you flip it and you do it the wrong way, he actually says, Eino yotze yedei chavato. This is very interesting. He says, you don't fulfill the mitzvah if they're in the wrong hand. It's such a serious thing. The Rambam and other Rishonim, like the Me'iri and others, say, no, no, no. It's just like a better way to do it, but you don't actually not fulfill your mitzvah if you switch the hands, right? It's very common. We don't always remember which one goes in which, and hopefully after learning this, you'll remember, okay? Because the Lulav has three together. That's why that goes in the more important hand, right? The other tricky part is always remembering which side of the Hadassim and which side the Aravot. Okay, anyway, not for now. So, Amr Le Rabbi Yirmi Yal Rabbi Sreik. My tam lo mevrachinan ela al natilat lulav. What's the reason why we only make the bracha al natilat lulav? I'm sure you probably thought about this, right? Why wouldn't you say al arba'at amini, right? Why lulav? So the answer, ho'il, right? Their question is not really answering the question, why one out of four? It's really saying, why, if we're going to choose one, only the lulav and not anything else? But really, it doesn't address the question of why wouldn't we say well, on the arba'at amini, right? Um, so that's a question we don't really have an answer to. But they do answer why lulav ho'il v'gavoa mikulam, because it's the tallest out of all of them. To which the Gemara thinks we mean it's higher up than all of them, to which they ask a funny question. Why don't we just put the lulav, the etrog, hold it higher than the lulav, and then it'll be higher. Therefore, we'll make a bracha on that. Amarlei ho'ilu b'mino gavoa mikulam. Says, ah, that's because b'mino gavoa mikulam, because its type is greater, it's taller. Right, and that's because its height is, it in of itself has the high, the the biggest height, not because it's it goes higher. Okay, and that's how we answer it. That's why we say on the tilat lulav and not on the others. Now, it's a really interesting source I saw, which is that if you remember, we discussed on daf lamid dalid that we lulav in general we hold doesn't need eged, even though we do it, we do it to make it nicer. But then if you hold it doesn't need eged, we saw this machlok at Bahag and Rabbeinu Tam about whether you could take one after the other. Now, according to the Bahag and those who hold like him, that you could theoretically take one after the other, there's a discussion in the Rishonim about how do you make a bracha in that case? You say, on the tilat lulav, and you pick up the lulav. Okay, then what? Then you pick up the hadasim. Do you make a bracha on that? So there's a debate. Some of them say you just make on the tilat lulav and then take one after the other. But the Me'iri says that you actually make a bracha on each type. And it's interesting what he says, because he says you say, on the tilat etzavot. Al nitilat aravan, al nitilat etrog. His language is even strange because he says etrog aravai. He doesn't say hadas. He says etzavot, enough etzavot, right? Where, uh, sorry, etzavot. He says I don't know why he doesn't say by all of them pre etzadar or arve nachal, right? Or he doesn't just say hadas aravan etrog. He says aravan etrog and enough etzavot. I don't know why he says it like that. Or sorry, nitilat etzavot. But in any case, he has extra brachot that you would say for each one. Okay, the Rosh and the Ran disagree. They say, no, 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 you only make one bracha. But it's an interesting debate. You can look it up in the Shulchan Aruch if you're interested in Or Chaim Tafresh Nun Aleph. Um, see if you bet or you can look at the commentaries there. It's a very interesting question. Obviously, much more theoretical because we don't take a lulav that way. But if you were to, it seems like he, some people think you would say extra brachot.
Okay, moving on. New Mishnah. Hechan hayu minanim. When would they shake the lulafa? All of a sudden, it's as if there's this issue of shaking, which we didn't discuss. And it's interesting, they don't discuss when you make the bracha. Most of the commentaries say that's because that's obvious. And we just mean, in addition, where else would you shake the lulav? Behodu la shem tchilav self in hodu in hala, which comes up in the middle of hala and also at the end of hala. Right? There's two times hodu la shem appears. Uba ana shem oshiana. And in the fr- and when you say Ana Shemoshiana, Divre Betilel, this is what we do nowadays in Halal. That's where we shake the Lulav. Ube Shama Yomrim Afba Ana Shematzlichana. Beit Shama says, even when you say Ana Shematzlichana, you also say. Right? There's those four lines. You say Ana Shemoshiana twice and Ana Shematzlichana. We only shake it like Betilel and Ana Shemoshiana. But Beit Shama would say you say it also in Ana, you shake it also in Ana Shematzlichana. Amar Rabbi Akiva. Akiva says, Tofe Hayiti Berabang Gamliel and Rabbi Yoshua. He says, I saw Rabban Gamliel and Rabbi Yoshua. I watched, I was in shul one day and I saw them, Rabbi Kiva says. Everyone was shaking their lulavs even more, probably like Beit Shammai at Ana Shematzlichana, and they only shook it at Ana Shemoshiana. It doesn't seem to mean they didn't shake it at Hodul Hashem. It means they didn't do it at Ana Shematzlichana. This is very interesting for many reasons. First of all, it shows some people were holding like Beit Shammai. It shows that when they saw the people, right, in the, they just did their own thing. Other people were doing something else. And notice they didn't say, and they screamed out and said, don't do that. They left it, right? And this is why so many people have a lot of different customs when it comes to things like this. Whatever everybody does, let them do it, right? It's, they can do it. It's not like it's a big deal if they do something extra, um, which is also an interesting point. Now the Gemara asks, Where all of a sudden did we come up with Nianua? No one talked about Nianua until now, or at least they're kind of saying it sounds like they didn't. So they say, Hatamkai. No, really, it refers back to a previous Mishnah where we saw about the Lulav. Because now that we've finished with the Ayaratamimim, each one, what's the unique disqualifications and all the criteria, now we go back to the first Mishnah, and we said there, as long as it has three tvachim in order to, and then what we really meant was, and another one in order to shake it, it's kasher. And then they say, oh, you mentioned the shaking. When exactly do we do the shaking? And then they ask, so where do we shake it? So now the Gemara also brings up another thing. We're now going to bring up a different Mishnah where we talk about shaking and then Rava on the next page, which we'll, we'll kind of do today, even though it's already the next page. But Rava is going to say the same thing is true for Lulav. So now we're going to talk about a different shaking. Tznanatam. It says there in the Mishnah, in Menachot, This is a special sacrifice they did on Shavuot. They brought two loaves of bread with two sheep. Um, and they say, Ketzad huoseh. How do they do it? There's a, there's a halacha there of hanafav, waving it. So how would they do the waving? You put the breads on the sheep, and then then you put your hand underneath it. Really, I would do it the reverse, right? For your hand, you put the sheep, then you put the, the she'alechem, and then you wave it. Okay, now we're going to see how exactly do you wave it. Um, I just want to check one thing. Um... Right, it's lambs. I wanted to just check, right? The kvasim, they really say are lambs, right? Just like the, the tamid sacrifice or kvasim. I always get confused a little between the animals. It's a lamb. Um, okay, and then what do you do? Menif. Then you wave it. How do you do it? Molichu mevi ma'aleu morid. You do it forward and backwards and up and down. Okay, which sounds like four directions. Shenema asher hunaf v'asher huram. Hanafa, it says hunaf and huram. Hanafa is backward, back, you know, forward and back. And huram is to lift up, up and down. So now the question is, why do you do it like this? We're going to have two different explanations. He says, you do it forward and back because that's showing the directions. Okay, there's this assumption. If you do two directions, it also means all four directions. You basically want to say, this is worship of God. God is in all four directions, and he's also in the heavens and the earth. And that's the idea of forward and back is the four directions, the four winds, the four directions, really. And up and down is heavens and earth. 
In Israel, they had a different version. Should be forward and back in order. This is all about the rain. The holiday is all about the rain. We're praying for rain. So we want to say we want rain, but we don't want bad winds. So we're going in the directions of the winds forward and back. And then, right, because the winds come from right, our territory, right, in those four directions. Malem will lead up and down. We want to get rid of bad rains. Rains come up to down, right? Winds come sideways. Rains come up and down. This teaches you This teaches you that minor parts of mitzvot basically prevent bad things from happening. In other words, this isn't a major part of the mitzvah. What does that mean? You see that if you didn't do the waving, you would still fulfill your mitzvah. If you just brought the sacrifice with the bread and you didn't do the waving, it would still be a complete mitzvah you'd be, or you fulfill your mitzvah even if you didn't do it in a complete fashion. So here you see that minor parts of mitzvah actually can be, they're, they're important enough that they could actually keep away evil things, bad things that we're trying to avoid. The here's the key line, v'chem belulav. You do the exact same thing by lulav. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute. We do shaking, we shake in all six directions, right? We do, we go around in a circle, right? In all four directions, then we go up and down. So why do we do that? That's not what it says here. This seems to indicate four. So there's a very fascinating, many different opinions about this. And the most interesting part is that there was influence of the Christians on this. There was a concern, okay, now I'll read you the rush, okay, the rush quotes first the Bala Etor. What's interesting about it is there's two different opinions that are each based on rejecting the other opinion because they each thought that the other opinion was going to look like a cross, okay? They imagine, right, in, in, the, in the Middle Ages in Ashkenazi countries where Christian influence was very strong. That was an issue. They didn't want it to look like we're making a cross, right? In the churches, they always do this shape of a cross. And if you do, so now you might, right, the question is, which one is going to look like a cross? So the Rush quotes the Bala Itor, who says, You only do one, two, and then up, down. Only. Why? Right? That's what we said, to the four directions. Once you do two, you know whoever rules the Ruchot in the north-south direction is obviously going to rule the Ruchot in the east-west. It's not like there's a, you know, a god of the east winds and the west winds and a god of the north-south ones. I mean, maybe there are, but we're not worried about that. Now, if you do all four directions, right, north-south, east-west, okay, right, he actually says it's, it's east-west you do and not north-south, that's an external opinion, meaning that's like the Christians, okay? It's a bad idea. Agka, that's what he says. He thinks if you do all four directions, that's going to look like a cross. Comes the rush and he says, but people didn't do it like that because they do all four ruchot. And he says, and that's a better minhag for two reasons. Number one, he says, what, you're too lazy to do all four, right? Our, is our, our hand too short that we can't do all four directions? Of course, it's better to praise God and say you rule all four directions. And furthermore, he says, you said that looks like a cross. This is much more like a cross, right? He says, the Rishon Shein I near Elo Shiva Arev. But he says, like the Etor said, that looks like Shiva Arev if you go north, south, east, um, east, west. But he says, Adraba, it's much worse. And it sounds, I agree with the Rush. And then Ole Umoridhu, Kanir Eshtiva Arev, right? He much looked, that's, he forks about, if you do forward, backward, up, down, that's four points. That looks a lot more like a cross. Whereas if you do the four ruchot and then up and down, you're going to have six, and that doesn't look like a cross because cross is with four. So basically, he says that's why we do all six directions so it doesn't look like a cross almost, right? So there was this interesting Christian influence on how we did, how we do this, how we fulfill this mitzvah, at least, right, in certain countries. What about the three, the fact that we shake three times each one? That comes actually from the Yerushalmi. The Yerushalmi brings that up. I have it in front of me. Um, the Yerushalmi says, Menaneh shofar. 
Tani, he brings a bright and the Yerushalmi, Tzarich Lina'anash Losha Pa'amim. You have to do it three times. So they say each Nyanua you do three times. There's all different ways about how people do this. Is each three times, do you have to do a Molich Mevi? Or do you have to actually shake that the Lulav itself shakes? Is it just pushing forward and back? Or is it that the Lulav itself shakes? Um, does it have to actually shake the lulav? That right? There's all, all debates about how to do this and different customs that have developed as a result of this lack of clarity. Anyway, that's in a in a nutshell the whole idea of nianua. There's a lot more to be said. There are a lot of interesting sources. We will leave it at that. Have a great day, everyone.